plant, he may be glorified. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins and they will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities and the desolations of many generations. Let's pray. Father God, we do pray for the children, not only of our city, but Lord, around the globe. Children are the most innocent and the most abused of all humanity. We pray for their protection. We pray for people like those that have adopted children via, with support from a great distance, those that do foster care, those that actually adopt children. We pray, Father, for the children under our care in tutelage, whether we be parents or grandparents or just associated from the same church. We ask that we will help our kids to get to camp and help our kids to understand the joy and to be participating in, and to be trained under the tutelage of adults in Bible school and Sunday school. Help us, Lord, to do our part to reach these youngest ones with the hope and the light of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you would place your spirit upon us in the same way that you placed your spirit upon your son. Send us now to our own city and place us among the poor with words and deeds of freedom in Christ. Empower us, your people, to speak good news with such life that people are transformed. Do not let the changes fade as a passing fashion, but implant, Lord, these newcomers into our neighborhoods as permanent displays of your life, as if they were growing together as a mighty tree. Give them your spirit so that they are charged with hope to bring renewal to desolate families and places. Mighty God, be glorified in the very settings where you are now currently forgotten in our community and other communities like ours around the world. Help us, Lord, as we're reaching out to those we don't know, but we do know need Christ, that we would also reach out to those that we do know that have the Lord but are still suffering. Lord, I pray for Cal as he grieves the loss of his dad this weekend. I pray, Heavenly Father, for those that are going through health issues, that they want to be here, but they can't because of those health issues. Lord, there are people who are not with us that are traveling or they're going through other issues in life we're not even aware of, perhaps, but they need the touch and the hand of God upon them. I pray that, God, you would meet their need. Those that are dealing with illnesses like cancer or some other difficult to treat or untreatable disease in their body, we know that you can bring healing, and we pray healing for these individuals. We pray, God, that you will manifest yourself in a way that we can't, but the Lord, that we would give prayers on behalf of these folks that we would send notes or make phone calls or texts or emails or something to say you're not alone even though you feel alone. That we care and we are praying and bringing you before the throne room of God. Help us indeed, God, rise up as a church, as a body of believers to minister to those who need our assistance. And that we would be Jesus with skin on to people who are suffering, to people who are lost, to people who are dying. And that, God, we would be a part of the transformation process as the light of Christ shines through us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of coming together in this house to worship you together. Be blessed as we worship you in music and worship you in the giving of our offerings and to worship you, Father, in the listening and the positive application responding to the gospel. Just stir Pastor Luke's heart, let him preach under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and let us receive under your anointing 
that which we need to hear today. I pray in the mighty name of Christ our Lord. Amen.
Good morning. Glad you're here on Daylight Savings Day. Anybody else feeling the hour less of sleep? I am. And with that, because I have to preface my talk just a little bit, um, when I get tired, it's way easier for me to get emotional. And um, so that might happen today, um, because along with that, this, this topic, what we're talking about today, um, is my passion. There is one topic of the Christian life that I could talk about all the time. It's the transformation that happens with Christ. And it's one of the reasons why I could so easily say yes to coming here, because our mission, our vision here is prayerfully building relationships and the transforming power of Christ for the glory of God's kingdom. 
and that's what it's all about. And so because this is deeply seated in me, and I'm so passionate and so yes to this, um, writing this talk was difficult because I had so much that I wanted to say, um, and I needed it to get concise and concise and concise, otherwise I could be up here for three hours, and we don't need that. <laughs> maybe we want that. Not today. Some other time, maybe. We'll do a sermon marathon. Um, but in concising it down, um, it just it was hard because there's so much that I want to say and can say, but I wanted to say um, one thing, and that's this transformation is possible and it's, um, and it's good. Um, so I'm going to pray um, and just kind of get us ready for this to happen. <laughs> Father, you're good. And I rest in that. And I do pray and acknowledge that the Spirit is upon me to proclaim this word. And with that, I pray that the Holy Spirit gives me words to proclaim boldly the mystery of the gospel. The gospel is this, Christ in us. Holy Spirit, I pray that these words are your words and that your words are remembered and any words that are mine in this, they are forgotten like that. Holy Spirit, come, be with us. Amen. So in the context of our series that we're going through, um, the Seek God for Our City, as we're prayerfully committed to um, praying for our community and partnering with our community and seeing new thing happened in our community. Kevin, last week, talked about um, the awakenings that take place. How people who are asleep, they're in slumber, they're dead in their sins, are awakened. And that, that only has happened when the people of God become burdened for their communities. When they have this ache in their heart for their neighbors. And um, they take that, ache, that passion um, to God and plead with Him to move. And it is in that, that prayerfully committed time, that all the great awakenings took place. And the week before, I talked about revival and how what we need first and what we need most is God. And that when God moves in his spirit, his people come to life. We're like dry bones, get flesh, and then the breath comes in. And it's only when that happens that we become mobilized um, to do the mission for which God has called us to do on this earth. And I ended that talk two weeks ago about saying how I felt like that one and this one that I'm giving you today kind of go hand in hand. Um, and I really believe that they do because it's that revival in that we see transformation take place. Um, because when bones become living people, that's a transformation. Um, but before I dive into the main meat, the good part of this talk, I have to talk, um, give a little background. And originally I was thinking of talking about spiritual senses, um, but I, I, I wrote that and it didn't fit well, and I was like, uh, is there a different path that I should take? And um, I was driving down to the cities on Thursday, and it just was like, I knew that I needed to take a different track. And so on your bulletins it says, for my intro, spiritual senses, you can cross out senses and put formation. Um, because that's what I want to talk about. Um, and spiritual formation can be more broadly described as personal formation. Um, because everyone is being formed into something. No matter what stage in life we are, um, what we are today is different from what we, are, what we were yesterday. And what we will be tomorrow is different than what we are today. And that is good news, that Christ is still working in us. Um, yeah, the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus um, said this, and I think there's profound wisdom in this, and I, I understand this concept that everybody's changing when I hear this, that no man has ever stepped into the same river twice. For, uh, ooh, I lost it. For it's not the same river, because the water's always flowing, and he is not the same man. 
Every person is on a journey. Everyone is looking for something. Everyone is becoming something. All our external circumstances, our internal motives, our decisions, our attitudes, everything, everything forms us in who we are going to be. And the arena of spiritual formation is the study and practice of having our spirits, ourselves, being formed um, into something. And specifically for us Christians, us being formed by God's Spirit into the likeness of God's Spirit. And there are in some circles um, that they write off spiritual formation for being too mystical or sometimes for being too Catholic. Um, which I kind of, I have reaction against that and I kind of, because I see this sense of spiritual formation, this becoming something in the writings of Simpson and Tozier, our giants of the CMA, who I look up to, and they called the spiritual formation idea, this becoming something, the deeper Christian life, the abundant life. And as I read about that, I'm like, this is just true discipleship under Christ, where we're actually learning how to be like him from him. It's Paul, when he says in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And Kevin told us last week, um, we need to put on Christ. We need to have his character, his life in us. And this is what I'm talking about, how to put on this character of Christ, how this transformation into Christ's likeness. And I am so, so, so excited. And my text for this talk is Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And over the fall, I used this in um, one of my lessons in youth group on a Wednesday night. And then I kind of talked about it, and then we do other things every week. And, but for like three or four weeks, Kate said I was still talking about Romans 12, 1 and 2, how I was still talking about this piece on transformation and becoming like Christ. And when I thought about it, yeah, I hope everything I talk about is this. Um... And it's a short scripture, um, and I am going to make you stand up again as I read it for us. This is Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. My paraphrase, the way, like after I read and think about verse 1, I come up with this. Because of what God has done for you, making you holy and acceptable by grace through faith in Christ, be holy and acceptable to God in your life. Live the type of life, live that type of life. This is the only logical, reasonable way to worship God. And hearing that, even as I say it now, and I hear that myself, my question is this. Okay, that sounds good, but how? How do I do that? How do I be holy and acceptable to God? Which I believe is why verse 2 is there, because... Paul knew, and he tells us. Um, and that's what I'm going to be like camping. That's what I'm focused on. This verse sets up two different methods of formation, and this, these two methods are for all people. And it's really easy to see, even for me, because the word form is in both of the methods. First, um, there's the, the world's way of formation, and it's by conforming. And when I hear that word, um, some images spring up to mind, and specifically, um, my military background makes me think of conforming because um, you never wanted to be the one that stands out in the Marines, especially in basic training, because if you stand out, then you're disciplined to fit back in. And that's not always a fun, that's not a fun thing to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Marines as an institution, they wanted to create more Marines, and they wanted all the Marines to be basically the same they wanted us to talk the same, walk the same, have the same basic knowledge, and even have the same basic character. The Marines wanted every Marine produced to be uniform, 
to their standards. And I use uniform as a loaded word because we stand out because of our uniforms. They make everyone look the same, and more than just making us look the same, they, um, they show that we belong to each other, um, which is why there's a certain outrage um, for military folks when we see a civilian wearing our, our uniforms because they haven't earned it. They don't belong. They're not, they haven't been formed. They're not, they're not like us. Um, and they try to put that on, and it just doesn't fit. There's a disconnect in our minds. Um, and along with that disconnect, it's also why you don't want to wear a red polo and khaki pants to Target. Because that's their uniform. You will get asked questions on where the TP is if you wear that. <laughs> and that's conforming. You're looking the same, you're acting the same, the same mindset. Um, and it's the world's way. The world is trying to make us all look the same. And that, that it seems to go against the standard message we usually hear from the world, um, and especially right now, which is, be yourself. You're special, a special snowflake. Don't let anyone else tell you who you are. But to prove that you are a special individual, by this, look like this, you may be specially unique, but to prove it, you need to be just like this just like everyone else. The message of the world is simple. You may be special, but you need to prove it. And we'll tell you how. Um, the J.B. Phillips translation of the New Testament um, says that conforming peace like this. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Squeeze you into a mold. I like that image. This squeezing, this forming method is always, always based on a lie about your identity and offers a false remedy to this lie. The basis of the lie is this. You are not enough. Not right. There's something wrong with you. But the remedy is if you look like this, behave this way, do this and that, and don't do this and don't do that, then you'll be fine. You'll find acceptance. You'll find love. You'll belong. And you can find this lie just about everywhere, that way of thinking. You can find it in schools. Um, you can find it in families. You can find it at your workplace. And s you can even find it at some churches. Have you, like, have you ever tried to gain g God's acceptance by trying to perform a certain thing, to behave a certain way, or not to do a certain thing, not behave a certain way? And not, not just because it's a command of God, because we should follow the command of God, but... In, instead of the motive being to please God, it's a motive from fear. That if you don't, there is no way God will accept and love you. Or if you weren't able to perform, you were certain that God held a grudge against you. That your faith in Christ, that, that salvation, um, was really just a loophole. And now God is obligated to accept you but he really doesn't like you. And it's, I see like this with parents and in my family even, um, when a child misbehaves, either my sister and I, the parent response is, I love you, but right now I don't really like you. And we kind of get that. Um, but I think it's kind of dangerous to attribute that kind of thinking, that attitude to God. And... Um, and if you kind of do, I want you to breathe that out and let it go and um, breathe this in and accept this instead. God loves you. He even likes you. He has already chosen and accepted you. And he does not regret, regret this decision. He has never regretted it, and he will never regret it. In fact, the reality is this. He's quite crazy about you. Amen. Amen. God is not about squeezing people to fit his mold. It's not his method of forming people. God's way is transformation. While confirmation speaks to squeezing and appearing a certain way, like forming sandcastles on a beach, transformation is so much more than that. My favorite way to imagine this is the standard one. It's a, it's a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It's transforming into something new. 
Everyone has seen it. Everyone knows it. Um, this little crawling green caterpillar goes into a cocoon, and a few days later, a butterfly comes out. And it's so much more beautiful than that caterpillar was before. We call this a metamorphosis. And that's exactly the same word Paul uses here in Romans. And the more I thought about this illustration, this image of a caterpillar to a butterfly, the more, more I liked it, the more I started saying no to other transformation processes we see and saying yes to that. Because it shows us clearly the truth of transformation. That at its root, at the root transformation, it's about becoming something new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And often we can look at this as a snap transformation, um, which it is. Once we, once we are in Christ, we are suddenly something new, something we were not b- before, but I think we can learn a little bit more about transformation from the caterpillar and its process of transformation, because it is a process. Once we accept Christ, we are something new. We're no longer crawling on our bellies, but we are not butterflies yet. We are in the cocoon. We are transformed and in the process of transformation. That is us, transformed and being transformed. 2 Corinthians 3.18 gives some clarification to this. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. Ever-increasing ever increasing what we were yesterday it's not who we are today and who will, we will be tomorrow is not who we are today and that is grace and re- when christ returns in his glory we will be with him in his glory transformed into glory ourselves we will be those beautiful butterflies but as we are now we're beautiful cocoons but god sees us He sees us as those butterflies um, that we're going to be because he sees Christ in us. God sees the acceptable one, Jesus, in us, which is how we become acceptable to him. There is no mold we can squeeze ourselves into to be accepted, but Jesus transforms us to fit without squeezing. And you may start to think, what about all of Jesus' commands? Um, am I saying that, there, that we don't have to worry about behavior now? There's nothing we can do to be transformed, so why even try? And I'm like, well, of course there's something we have to do. That's why we have to look, look at verse 1 of chapter 12. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Really what Paul is saying is, be who you are. You are holy and accepted. Be holy and acceptable. It's identity first, not behavior first. Behavior will come later, and we'll get to that. But you need to know who you are before you can act like who you are. You won't understand why you have to do certain things if you don't, if you don't understand, if you don't know what comes first. Which kind of brings us to point two. How does this happen? How does this transformation take place in our lives? How do we actually live this new way, this holy, acceptable, this promised deeper, abundant life. And our text says this is how, by the renewal of our minds. In order to live this way, how we think is of the utmost importance. How we act is deeply connected to how we think and what we think about. And I think central in our dealing with how we think is how we think about ourselves. We've been talking about this already. You are already loved, chosen, holy, and acceptable. You may just not always think that way about yourself. You need to see yourself as you actually are and think about yourself as you truly are. Our minds must be renewed because we already have a certain idea about ourselves. And I'm not just talking about body image. We we have this idea about ourselves in our deepest place, our character, our personality. Some would say our soul or our spirit. We kind of have an idea of what that is like in us. And when we have that idea and it's out of sync with how God actually sees us, um, 
because God sees us as we truly are. Um, and there is no way we can project a false image to God. We can fool everybody else but him. Um, when we're out of sync with his knowledge of us, that's when we experience the most pain, the most hurt, the most suffering, because we're outside of the will of God for us, because we are outside of the God's image of us. We are outside of what is his good will, his acceptable and perfect will. So we must begin with a foundational change in how we think. The basis for what you think about cannot be reliant on ourselves. It must be on God. We, we have to think about how God thinks about us. In his epistle to the church in Colossae, Paul says that in Christ you are new. You are transformed, and to continue in the process of transformation, you have to take off, like clothes that are out of style, your old self the self that God no longer recognizes. And you have to put on your new self, the one that is being renewed in knowledge, in the mind, after the image of its creator. Aligning ourselves with God's truth about us is the only way that transformation can happen. You see, God is much, much more interested in your transformation than even you are. Paul writes to the Philippians that he is sure that God, who began this good work in you, We'll see it to completion. I have to stop there because that's just so good. Because I'm not my primary work. I am God's work. So I don't have to squeeze myself. I can let God transformation. And I can kind of, and then even with that, I can kind of let go of trying to form you guys. I can let God do that. Because God is even more interested in your transformation than I am. And I am interested in it. I want to see us alive in Christ, the fullness of life. But God wants that even more than I do. And, it, but, and then we have to recognize that it's not just God. While his work is what we need most and what we need first, his spirit is what we need, um, our participation is also required. This work of renewing the mind, the process of transformation, requires both God and our individual effort. And our effort isn't about trying to squeeze ourselves into this Christian mold. It's about authentically becoming a living sacrifice, becoming, God, becoming who God has already made you to be, and becoming who you already are will only happen in the context of your relationship with God. I, be, I believe that transformation, anytime we like rub shoulders with each other, we're changing each other. So it only makes sense that it's as we're rubbing shoulders with God that he'll begin to change us. By spending real quality time with God, focus on the truth revealed by him about who he is and who we are in him is the only chance we, we've got to become fully and deeply transformed. And I'm and like this deeply devoted stuff isn't about five minutes of prayer when you wake up. And it's not um, praying quick before a meal or a short devotional, which are all good things. Those are so good things because they help focus us. But we need something deeper, something more. I'm talking about radical, committed time to dwell in the presence of God. Kind of like what we do on Sunday mornings when we're together. This is how we put to death the old self and become our new selves in Christ by being with and setting our minds on Christ. Distractions and interruptions, interruptions, anything that takes our minds off of the focus of Christ kills the life of Christ in us. So we've got to train ourselves to always have Christ at the forefront of our minds, to have him dwell with us always, and to not let anything take his place in our lives. And the ancient Christians... Um, to do this, develop what we call the spiritual disciplines to help, to help them. They're like, these distractions are coming from all over the place. How, how can we discipline ourselves to be focused on Christ? Because they understood without that discipline, they would slip off. And the disciplines were good. Disciplines of prayer, community worship, of giving, of fasting, and silence and solitude. All good things to keep our minds on Christ but really, really bad when used as a mold to prove holiness or to gain acceptance from God. Because some see the disciplines as a way to get something from God, a transaction. I do this, you do that. I won't eat for this day, 
and I'll say I'm praying to you, and you'll tell me if I should take this job, if I should go to that school, or if I should date that girl. And that's not their purpose. That pur- their purpose isn't to get something from God. It's to be with God. They are also not meant to be a way to prove your holiness. You don't have to do the disciplines to be a good Christian. They are tools and methods given to us by those who have gone before to help get our minds off of the distractions of the world and of the distractions of ourselves and help us to get the focus back on God. And it always works in paradoxes. And I talked about paradoxes with the youth this morning. I'm like, oh, everything fits together. Um, Because in solitude, the discipline of solitude, we're not alone. You may be physically alone, but you're actually spending committed time with God. In fasting, while you're taking time to not eat, you're actually feasting on God and feeding your spirit. In giving, you're not losing wealth. You're not losing something. You're gaining freedom from it. And in community worship, when we're spending time with each other, we're not just spending time with each other. We're spending time with God, with the God that dwells in us. So when we're together, I'm not just seeing you. I'm seeing Christ in you. I'm seeing Christ in you. And when we spend time together, we're spending time with God. With his followers, his walking, moving, breathing temples. And by the very nature of God, and by what happens when you're spending this type of disciplined time together, you'll be transformed by him. It'll just happen. Um, not, and, and in this transformation, you'll be transformed. You'll start living a certain way. You'll behave in a certain way. Not because you're being squeezed and under compulsion, but it will just happen naturally. Um, the things that could have once been viewed as a squeezing thing um, are just normal things now. Instead of being a person who works really hard and disciplines themselves to not do what they're not supposed to do and to do what they're supposed to do, it just happens. Like how a tree is just being a tree, it'll produce fruit. Excuse me. So then, with that, if we can just become who we're supposed to be, I don't have to squeeze you, and I don't have to shame you. I don't have to say, you know better than this, um, and kind of get on you and get all big and put on the pastor's voice. Um, I, can, I can call you out. I can um, speak the truth of who you really are in Christ and kind of let Christ have his way with you. Um, the Holy Spirit will convict you on things that are outside of his will in your life. Because you just know who you truly are. And if you're like, you kind of know who you are in Christ, but you just need something explained. I, I, I stole this from um, Pastor Johnson in, at Church of the Open Door in Maple Grove, and it's the biggest transformation piece in my life when I heard him say this for the first time, and I just dwelled on it for probably, what has it been, almost four years, so I've been dwelling on it for a little over four years now. Um, And it's about the truth of who you are in Christ. And this is what he says, because I know who you are in Christ. You are outrageously loved by an outrageously loving God. You have infinite worth. You are a child of God, the bride of Christ, the friend of Christ. You have the life of Christ in you. You are united with Christ. You have been raised with Christ. You are the co-worker with Christ. You are a citizen of heaven. You are free from condemnation. You are the masterpiece of God. And any voice that tells you differently, including your own voice, is a liar. That's the truth. When I heard that the first time, it was even worse than it is right now. (laughs) Um, Because, like, I never heard that before. And I may have heard it before, but it never transformed me. In that moment, I was being transformed. Something new was coming to life in me. Because, although, 
because before that, all I was trying to do was fit into a mold of being a Christian person. And then I was becoming a Christian. And always, that always happens in the realm of community. Because we're in this life together. And like I said before, Christ is in you, and Christ is in me, and Christ speaks through you to me. And I hope Christ speaks to you through me. I hope we have this community. Um, this truth-speaking, life-giving, grace-dispelling community. And as this happens, um, what, how does this affect a community? And not just a church community, though it will affect a church community. How does this affect the community at large? How does this affect Hibbing if we become these type of people? Um, because it isn't just about us. And this whole issue of transformation isn't meant to be solely an individual thing lived out in a vacuum. It's um, prayerfully building relationships, transforming power of Christ for the glory of God's kingdom, for the expansion of God's kingdom. It will spill out into the community. And as transformed individuals live together and realize their identity in Christ, a couple things are going to happen naturally. First, there is going to be radical generosity. In Acts 2, after the Spirit has fallen on the apostles, Peter has preached the first Christian sermon. Thousands are saved. Read this. We read that this is what the first transformed community was like in Acts 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe as the many wonders and signs being formed, performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The followers of Christ were so devoted to not only their transformation, but to the transformation of the community that they didn't care what was theirs and what wasn't theirs, but saw everything as a tool to bring glory to Christ. And I'm not saying we need to start a Christian commune and become communist um, to be in the will of God, um, because that would just be another mold. What I'm saying is that God cares about how we treat each other and how we bless each other. And this, is, this isn't me coming down on this congregation. This is me lifting the congregation up because this is what we're already doing. Um, I've seen this personally, and then we saw this corporately um, last week when we were doing the sledding, and we were giving hot dogs and hot cocoa and cookies to all the kids and families that were sledding. And it was a great time to be together and to be in the community showing this kind of generosity, this transformed generosity to people who don't know Christ yet. And maybe they'll want it. Because um, they see with, that we're together with glad and sincere hearts. We praise God and enjoy their favor by being generous. And the Lord added to their number daily who were being saved. And that's what we want to see. Let's keep up the good work. Let's not grow weary in the blessing of our neighbors. Secondly, this transformation brings about radical transparency and repentance. Acts 19 um, has this story of when Paul came to Ephesus, and he began preaching, and he came in power, and People were being saved. The whole town was in a stir, and there were just tons of people who were coming to faith. And more than just coming to faith, they were turning aside from their old lives. Those who practice witchcraft burned all their magic books in front of everyone, and the total was about 50,000 drachmas, um, which were about the equivalent to a day's wage, and converted to years. That would be about 137 years of wages burned. In America, I looked up the average income for um, a year, and it's about $45,000. So that, equated to our type of life, is over $6 million burned for the glory of God, which blows my mind. Um, 
And it changed the whole economic scene in Ephesus. The shop owners were going crazy because no one was buying their idols anymore, and they had to think of a way to kick Paul out because they were going to go bankrupt with him staying there because they were making their money off of exploiting um, spiritual things to the people. And that's why he was forced to leave the city. It wasn't the gospel of Christ. It was Christ lived out in community, which is the gospel of Christ. I sh didn't phrase that quite right. Um, the leaders could ignore Paul's preaching, but they could not ignore what the result of that preaching was. That's the better way to put it. They cannot ignore the truth that when Jesus transforms people, everything changes. Um, and that's why the issue of transformation is so important. And that idea of radical repentance and the abandoning of the old life um, comes into my story as well. And I, I wasn't planning on sharing this, and um, it wasn't until we were worshiping, and I, I just felt the Lord um, that I shared that little bit of who we are in Christ. Um, that transformed me. And kind of with that, um, I was dealing with some things in my life, and I was, that was my second semester at Crown. I was starting to get into a small group um, that the focus was to um, live a lust-free life, LFL, um, lust-free life, yep. Um, and basically, the topic we were combating was um, um, lust, um, but more specifically was internet pornography and masturbation. Um, and really, that was the first time that I confessed that because that was in my life in high school where I just said that. Um, <clears throat> that was who I was. But it wasn't who I was because I was in Christ, but I had this thing that went so against who I thought I was in Christ that I just, I couldn't bring it into the light. But knowing who I was, and having community that saw the Christ in me made me able to confess and repent and step away from that and experience freedom from that. It was more than I could ever imagine. Because they saw Christ in me. And they told me who I was in Christ. That I was loved by him. That I was a child of the Most High God. And that they were brothers with me and warriors with me in, in that. And it, it changed how I, I could actually fight against it. And I could actually confess it and leave it. Um, and it's the transforming work of God and community. So con to conclude, the truth of Christ is this. We are not who we once were. And more than that, what we are going to be is not just who we are now. God is working right now in us to bring about a deeper re resemblance to his son. The grace of God is deeper and wider and much more expansive than we know. And it doesn't just save us, it makes us new. Um, I'm going to pray, but if the worship team would come up um, and close us out in worship, I just want to pray. God, you're good. Every day, we see more and more of your goodness. Help us to um, submit to the Christ in us, um, the convictions of the Holy Spirit, to continue to work, work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it's God that's at work in us. And this partnership, help us never abandon you in it. Help us to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Help us to think about who we are in you, who you have made us to be, and rejoice in that. And sing amazing grace. Amen. Would you all stand, please?
Father God, those of us that are here who have been delivered from our sins and have received the joy of your salvation, we understand the importance, the impact of this truth that our chains are gone and we have been set free. But our enemy, Lord Jesus, still wants to impose bondage on us, wants us to believe that we have to act in a way to please you. We have to we have to do something to please you rather than doing this out of our love for you. That the enemy wants us to go back to the works concept. God, you are a God that redeems and you are a God that transforms. And so I thank you for the transformation you're making in us. I thank you, Lord, and I agree with what Pastor Luke said, Lord, how this congregation is rising up and being generous and demonstrating through, through the acts of the love of Christ in us and through us who Jesus is. Continue, Lord, to develop us according to the image of Christ. And help us, Lord, not to say that we're at a certain point and we've reached that pinnacle, but rather to know that we can be so much more than we are right now as we continue to surrender our control to you. Transform us by the renewing of our minds and make us like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in God's peace.